All right, what's going on, everybody? Y'all already know what's up. This is episode 11 of the Pootie Tim Show, and we back for the new year. You know, if you haven't seen any of the last episodes, go check them out on youtube.com slash Pootie Tim. All right, so for the new year, we here with a special artist. You know, I'd like for him to introduce himself. What's going on, folks? This is Ron Draper, um, Harlem all day. <laughs> Word, definitely. <laughs> Artist, educator, uh, curator, just all around creative. Um, welcome. Happy to see you here. Word, it's good to have you here. So, you know, I wanted to talk about before we get into the work that you've been doing and things that you have, like, coming up in the future, like, can you let the people know anything about, like, your college education background or anything like that? Yeah. Um, the St. John's University was legal major, um, business minor. So I've taken courses, like, art wasn't the initial trajectory. Art was just kind of something I liked to do in high school, or even before then. But when I got to college, it was all about law, business, accounting, management, like, just the business side of things. So it kind of helped prepare me for where I am now. Okay, and then what um, degree, so while you taking that, what degree you graduated with, being that it wasn't really, like, based on art? Oh, um, my Bachelor's of Science. Okay. Did you get like a master's or anything after that? Nah. Or? Oh, you just got the bachelor's. Yeah. I right. and you know just so we can see that um, you got a bachelor in science and now that you're doing art, like, can you give some things about like do students need a degree for art specifically or what do you think about that? Like, uh, do about I don't that? necessarily say you need a degree for art, but you do want to educate yourself, whether it be from a formal institution or whether it be from just doing research, you still want to educate yourself, because everything you learn in school, you still can learn kind of outside of school, so don't take me saying you don't necessarily need a degree to do art, meaning that you don't need to educate yourself on things that will help you be better as an artist and a person who's conducting business, because that's what you are. Okay, cool. Nah, that's fine. I get what you're saying. So people out there, you know, because I know some people who trying to go to school and they be like, yo, I, I, need, I need to go to college to do this, especially in like art or some sort of like engineering with like music is like, yo, I want to go to this music school. And I'll be like, I don't think you necessarily like need it, need it. You know, don't put yourself like in debt over you something. Don't, you don't need it, need it, but let's not pretend like school is not an amazing thing. Like right. everyone doesn't need it. And there's this huge misconception that I think exists when it comes to college debt. College debt isn't a bad thing. Right. The debt itself is what allows you to go to school. If you can't afford to go to school, here you go. That's like saying, yo, don't buy a car. Like, people get, have car notes all the time. You have house notes all the time. Right. It's like saying, yo, don't buy a house because you'll be in debt. Yeah, definitely. It's a good thing. What happens is it becomes a bad thing if you don't protect your investment. Okay. So if you're going to invest and take on that debt, make sure you're getting the best return on investment you can. Mm. So if that means kind of just pursuing what you do afterwards, fine, but college is an investment. It's not just debt. People forget that. It's not like you're buying, like, nonsense. Yeah, it's exactly. your education, you're investing in yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to incur, you're going to incur some bills and some, you know, some tuition fees and whatnot. <laughs> right. Okay. But it's an investment in yourself, and what happens is, is people miss the point, miss the whole experience of college, or afraid to go just because debt is debt, but that's what allows you to get the education you want. What happens is it becomes a bad thing when you're not taking advantage of it. Mm. You go to school, take advantage of it. Take advantage of the resources afforded to you. Take advantage of the clubs. Take advantage of the people there. Because some of the friends you make in college will be the friends you have for the rest of your life. Like, of all my groomsmen, I think four out of six of them I met in college. Mm. Damn, that's fire. Hell yeah. That's crazy. And they all in the art form? Like, all in art or they do... All creatives. Um, two of them own their own fashion company. Okay. One is into finance, which is a creative <clears throat> field in his own. Okay, cool. Cool. That's fire. So there you have it. You know what I mean? Like, you take advantage of college. I feel like, yo, just hook your shit. I like take that. Yeah. Of it. Like, <laughs> dude, it's an investment. Like, like say, oh, college is debt. Yo, then don't... What are you buying a house for? Unless you're paying for a house cash? Yeah. What's the difference? Is debt, or no matter what, college loans are worth it. It's there's debt all around you. If you think debt isn't worth it, then don't own a credit card, don't don't, don't get a mortgage, don't have a car note because it's all the same thing. But they're all investments in yeah. what you want to do. Like a house is an investment if you treat it right. Right. So. It'll it'll accumulate. It'll grow in appreciation. If you go to college, yes, it's debt. But if you 
use that information, if you use all the resources that are given to you for that, then yeah, you whatever you like, I'm okay paying my college loans. I'm fine. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> I took money. advantage of resources afforded, even though I'm not in the same field. A lot of what I learned is pertinent now. Okay. And yeah. if I do it all over again, I do the exact same thing. Okay, yeah, definitely. So being that, I like how the way you talk. So what type of role, like, do you have as an artist in society? What is the role you push? Because I see, you know, doing the research on you with the certain awards you won or the things, the the um, interviews you get and all that. You real, you got an actual, like, voice out there and an image. So what type of role do you have in society? Um, well, it's a lot. You can go and talk about for this for hours. But yeah. at the same time, <laughs> when it comes to artists, artists don't realize how important art is, right? Look mm-hmm. at the history books. History books give you tons of text without real context. Right. Now, you're going to learn some things, but you're not going to learn how things happen. You're not going to learn necessarily how people felt. What art does, now when I say art, I'm not talking about just visual art. I'm talking about visual art. Um, you're talking about poetry. You're talking about rap music. You're talking about theater. You're talking about photography. Mm-hmm. That all, you can't get as much, you're not going to get a full context from just reading a textbook. So understanding you're going to get firsthand, like first person narratives. And I'm trying to remember in high school, they were talking about like primary and secondary with the resources. I forget, but I know a textbook is not a primary source. Yeah, it's not. Textbook's a secondary source. Okay. Art is a primary source because you're talking directly with people that experience those times. Right. And you get a full comprehensive, the more art you see that's kind of grown from one particular time, the more of a comprehensive view you'll see of things that were going on. Because you can take the same exact year and look at all the artwork created in that year right. and see so many different perspectives as people are feeling good, bad, and indifferent. Okay. So art itself is just a storytelling like resource. Right. So for me, I just kind of am very cognizant of that when I'm creating my work and understanding that I do have a duty and responsibility to kind of tell my truth. Okay. Because there's no one truth. Truth is something that's Subjective to time, space, location, age, gender, whatever it may be. So we're all going to have different truths. So when you're talking about looking at the world and just whole, whole views or whole viewpoints, you want to make sure you're getting as many perspectives as you can. So understand that you are a part of that perspective, which I am. It's just making sure you're putting out responsible content. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Smooth. Hell yeah. And what <clears throat> type of art do you... um? Identify yourself. What is what do you identify the art you identify with? Like, what would you call your? It's been art? years. I still haven't figured that out. But I don't think you need to. Okay. Just call it art. I don't know. Like, sometimes it looks a little bit like. You know, if you look at all my work, you can't pinpoint any one particular thing here. If you right. just say, you know, if you if you put a gun in my head, <laughs> and I right. had to say something, yeah, just think of motivational art. Like, okay. I can't really speak on it in the sense of just. It's oil painting or it's this because it's not. Right. <laughs> I'm look, even sitting in the one space with the limited work I have here, nothing really looks the same. Yeah, I Nothing get looks it. the same, but it all has the same style because it all comes from me. Right. Now, I like it because it do have, like, you know, like a, a graffiti sense. Then it has, like, a mural type. Like, it's all together. You get what I'm saying? That's why I like it a lot. When I was seeing your work, I'm like, damn, this is something different. And especially, like, how the way you're using the wood. You use the glass and things like that. And I'm like, yo. And then on top of that, it has a message. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about the message, like, you know, you provide, like, inspirational, like, uplifting things. You know, I know art is, you know, universal for everybody. But especially, like, for African-American women and men. You know, like, how did that come about, like, in having that as a major theme in some in the work you do? It's not that, like, you go out looking for something. Like, your truth is what you know. Your truth is what you live. Your truth is what you see and feel and love every day. So it's not as if my goal was just to, all right, I'm going to empower this, do this. Like, yo, I'm a man of color. So mm-hmm. everything that you're going to get comes from the black experience. It's not to say anything is more or less important than what my work is, but me being a young man of color, you're going to get work from a young man of color and just that's the world we kind of so what I live in that's my truth that's what I'm saying that's more so a thing where people have to tell their truths because anyone has to kind of tell their story you can't tell a story people you think people want to hear right you gotta tell what your story is so your own experience yo like like that 
My soon to be wife is black. My mother is black. My sister is black. Like, not to say I live in a black only world, but yeah. these are the people that are around me every day. That's the way it is. Like, if you look at the Greeks, the Greeks are painting white people because that's what they knew. That's what yeah. they see in front of them. That's what, that's what their reality is. Yeah, so, they so yeah, just well. paint it. No one's saying why can you only paint it white people or Greek people because you're fucking Greek and yeah, that's, that's what what's know. around. That's what you know. <laughs> it's not to say that. Nothing else is important. I'm like, this is just what I know. This is my reality. And that doesn't take away from anyone else's. But it's understand we need just full discourse of what's going on. Right. Like, if I'm, like Malcolm X once said, the, the black woman is the most disrespected person in America. And you think about it, you have women who have been across the board, right. just vastly mistreated. And you have people of color across the board who have been vastly mistreated. So the only group that fits into both of that is the woman of color. Exactly. So if we know, like, we can all agree here. It's not like we're saying anything, like, out of, out of left field here. Mm-hmm. You know, then people of color have not been treated as fairly as people who aren't of color. We can agree on that for the most part. Right. If that you take be. the fact that women have not been treated as fairly as men. As a man, I greatly, I can agree to that. I can understand that. I can acknowledge that. Right. And the only group that kind of intersects both of those is just the African American woman. And I guess I grew up all like I had a lot of black friends. I had like these are just the environment you're in. So yeah. it's not me saying the hell with everybody else. It's just know my reality, understanding that this is my story. Yeah, exactly. Do it doesn't doesn't eyes. null and void your story. It doesn't <laughs> doesn't right. take away from what anyone's story can and will be. This is just my story in particular. That's why everybody has to tell their story so everyone understands that. Other stories are in, are in existence. Other stories will be present. Mm-hmm. So just tell your story. But um, my role is just doing what I do. And these themes are just what I see. This is my reality. Right. And it's fire because, like like you said, you're telling your story. But it's actually for everybody. Like, everybody can relate. That's what makes it special. Because it's yeah. not... I'm not a... Like, people... You can take my work... You can't actually. No. When you look... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you, yeah, you can. So let's, let's be very clear yeah. <laughs> When you're looking at a particular <laughs> thought process, you're looking at particular events, it's easy to kind of go the negative way. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember people were telling me years ago when Trayvon Martin, where it was just a whole kind of assortment of people being murdered by police. Right. How come you don't have a Trayvon Martin piece? I was making Trayvon Martin piece before Trayvon Martin was Trayvon Martin. Right. But mine just looked a little different. It wasn't going to be the... I don't focus on the negative... I'm always been the guy to kind of focus on the positive, right. where it's not going to be like stop mistreating my black women. Okay. It's going to be, hey, black women, you appreciate just in case you don't feel that way. Because me telling someone else to treat them better yeah. is not going to fix how they, how people or women of color feel or people of color feel. Right. So as opposed to trying to talk to the people doing the oppressing, okay, yeah. I kind of help to I try to uplift those who are being oppressed yeah, or feeling like they're oppressed. It's, it's the same thought. It's like the same. The message comes from the same place. It's just who needs a who needs the truth more? Who needs a delivery more? Who needs this more than like instead of telling cops stop killing us, you tell people like yo keep on fighting your fight. Yeah, it comes from the same exact place. Right. But it's just how you deliver your message. Exactly, and then that's crazy that you say that because like that's what you know like some people do when like there's something that's going on on TV or it's a trend or it's like something con- controversial. That's when they want to create a piece knowing that you know sometimes not everybody yeah. but sometimes they create a piece knowing that they're gonna get that type it's of like, feedback because of the controversy that's going on where it's like no create like you said you don't create it because someone else said oh why you don't make this piece even yeah. though you can create it and make it fire but it's like no, no I don't wanna, this is, yeah. it, like, I'm not gonna focus on any one particular instance I'm gonna focus on the bigger picture yeah the whole thing and the bigger picture is something that like, this situation or this, the state of the country is not because of those particular situations, because of a bigger mindset. Right. So understand my approach is to acknowledge or to address, rather, the, the mindset that creates these occurrences. Okay. So yeah, Trevor Martin, we all understand. Trevor Martin, you have a Kai Gurley, you have Eric Garner. I can go on for yeah, an hour yeah. just exactly. giving names. <laughs> but when I'm addressing, I'm not addressing those particular instances. What my thought process is, is addressing and acknowledging the mindset that creates that on both ends. Mm-hmm. Because I have friends who are cops. 
right. I have friends with law enforcement. I've had family that's been law enforcement. Gotcha. And it comes to a point where I'm not going to say there aren't good police out there, but it's like a, it's a cyclical effect that just creates a cycle of mistrust. Right. Because what happened is you have people were angry on both ends, right? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. If cops were angry, people of color were angry. Now, all it takes is an angry cop to, f- to kind of taint the mind of a young man of color who believed all cops are cool, like they're here to save us. All it takes is that one experience from the kind of turn the tides, right? Then what happens is that same young man of color might be angry after that point and run into a good cop, and that good cop's going to get one hell of an experience because that one man of color doesn't trust any cops. Gotcha. So it's, it's something that's a bigger problem than just, like one occurrence or two occurrences. This is a huge mindset issue that it just has to kind of be addressed and acknowledged. You can't deal with, you're dealing with the causes, let me not say that, you're dealing with the reactions rather than the causes. Mm-hmm, gotcha. So I'm trying to get to a point a little before you get to the reaction. So if I'm talking about the mindset, if I'm talking about hey, people of color, be strong and understand that you are loved, that's because some of you guys feel like you're not. Mm-hmm. So if you feel like you're not loved, what happens is you get to a point where you feel of hopelessness, where you're going to feel like you have nothing to lose, but that's because no one really told you that they loved you, or no one told you that you're someone who should be loved. So you have that worthless, you have that hopeless, you have that kind of like, I got nothing to lose mentality. Yeah, you got that chip on your shoulder. got that chip on your shoulder. For, like, I'm not saying it's for nothing. Some things are warranted, but sometimes you just need to hear something that'll change that whole thought. Yeah. So that's kind of what my work addresses. Got you, got you. And then, that's fire. And then on top of that, like, are you into, like, poetry and stuff? Because even your work, like, with your own, like, the sweater you have on now, like, the Dear Black Woman piece and the paintings you have where you write in a message, like, you give that, you give that out, like, poetry. Are you into that as well? Or you just create it just for, you know, a message? Like, you know, how do you imply that to your work as well? Like, as far as... Poetry, no. Um, Like, I know I... I understand it's not necessarily my lane, but then again, you'd be surprised. Like, mm. I'm not a poet. I've always had a way with words. Okay. Um, like, I know how to phrase things. I've worked in sales jobs for years, so I know how to kind of take words and use them in a way to affect change of any sort. Mm-hmm. But all these are literally like love notes. Gotcha. So what I've done, like people always ask, like especially with the dear black woman, like wow, like how did like how can you create something that's so that feels so heartfelt, right. and, but yet so open that almost anyone can kind of feel the same way or feel and relate to it, rather. Mm-hmm. Because this is a note that I originally wrote to my fiancé. Ooh, smooth. So, so like, this is a, like, so this note, playing, that piece of art was like. written for her. So right. all of these love notes are all written to somebody. So even if I'm trying to think of something very generic or something that's more widespread, mm-hmm. what I do is kind of think of someone that I know and love and care for okay. And put their face to it, and that's why it feels so hard for it because it is. Right. So I don't think not really into poetry, but I'm into words. If that makes yeah, no, nah, it makes perfect. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I, yeah, I get what you. I never even thought about that. I, I yeah. yes, I kind of am. Right? Yeah, because I look at it and I'll be like, damn, yo, that's smooth. Like I like how the way you did that, and it's just you know because we need that. Not a lot of people, you know, I see on the gram and all that women are feeling certain type of ways they express yeah. themselves. So, you know, like, and then seeing art is like, yo, and then the sweaters, the pieces that you do, I'm like, yo, that's fire. You know what I'm saying? I really, I ain't going to lie. I'm, I'm, I'm going to need one of those. We got to figure it out. Like, people don't realize my work is all one of a kind, but when it comes to the sweatshirts, right. I do, like, one run and it's over. Oh, okay, cool. Like, if you ain't got it, it's, it's over. over. All right, bet, like, bet. I'm not going to, for one, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm not a fashion designer, so I'm not going to sit here and focus my whole operation yeah. onto the sweatshirts like it's not it's not really a I don't got, it's not really my thing i don't got time for that mm-hmm. i don't have the patience i don't i understand i don't have the patience i'm not gonna do it to myself i'm not gonna do that to my supporters in which i'm creating something i can't excuse me stand behind 100 like, percent. Right. i can but only to a certain mm. extent okay like anything more than like the number of sweatshirts i produce is going to be more it's going to require more dedication and require more of me than I can currently give because of everything else that I'm doing. Got you. And this is just like, it's like prints. I hate prints. Like, I don't like art prints. Because okay. my work, as you can see being here, doesn't translate well into prints. Mm-hmm. Like, this wouldn't make sense as a print. Right. Like, it doesn't. My work is just not that, and that's okay. Yeah. So what my prints often look like are sweatshirts like this. Because this is just a piece of artwork. Right. There was an original that looked like one of those, the love notes, mm-hmm. that 
was just this. Okay. And people miss that and think that I just make it in sweatshirts. I'm not. It's just my artwork on a sweatshirt. Like, he literally took the image of a sweatshirt and put it on, on put the image of the artwork and put it onto a sweatshirt. Right. Gotcha. So, yeah, right. just things just need to be said. And I guess every way you want to take it, if it affects you in a good way, then so be it. Right. Got you. And, um... Like when you first started, how has like your um practice like changed over time? Like was it a time where it was like yo you like you was trash with the art or you always had like skills with art? Like and how has your practice changed over time with that? Now, I've always had skills. Like I'm like I went to art design high school. I've been an artist my entire life. Okay. But a lot of people know me from at college, but if you met me in college, I thought I was past that art phase in my life. Because I was into art up until I graduated high school. Mm. The high school I went to, I felt like I, it normalized art. Like it took art, took all the inspiration. You taught me skill, but you didn't teach me why it's important. You didn't teach me why I should be doing this. You didn't help me to tap into art as I knew it or art as I should experience it. It was just skills and colors and gradation and shading. That's not what art is. Art is expression. But the whole school missed that point. And you was losing a love for it? Yeah, of every, that? a lot of people I know who went to school with were like, yo, you're still doing art. That's dope. That's because like, art has always been me. But if you met, like I said, if you met me in college, people thought, like, where does art come from? All of a sudden, you're doing art. Like, nah, I've been doing art for a while. And even yeah. if you look, I think I said, my, my funny thing is, my mother kept my high school portfolio. Right? <laughs> I'm betting I still have it. It's in here somewhere. I don't know where, but it's in here somewhere. If I show you the work from high school when I was like 13, 14, mm-hmm. you'll see it has a very similar feel. Right. Because art is your personality. Art is your expression. If you're expressing yourself through everything, you're going to see a commonality from the age of 8 to the age of 28 to the age of 38. It's going to be the... Because you don't change. Your personality does not change. Right. So my, the methods of artwork have changed. My work, the size of work obviously has changed, but... Um, I've been into it forever, and it's just me evolving as opposed to changing. Okay. My artwork hasn't changed in decades. Oh, wow. Right. It just evolves into what you see now. Got you, got you. And have you ever had, like, <laughs> any embarrassing moments in the art world? So it's like, damn, like, that was, that was harsh, or, like, yo, I can't believe I went through that. You know what I'm saying? Whether it be a comment, or you was at an event, or something like that, or anything. Have you ever had, like, an embarrassing moment? Like, damn, I got to step it up, or I, I got to. Uh, I remember yeah. doing this one art show, right? This one art show I was so like, excited to do. I won't mention the agency that does it. <laughs> but I remember being so excited. I was like, yo, this is dope. I can't wait to do it. And there's so much going on. And kind of when I got there, I was like, yo, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah. It's like, yo, there's too much content going on here. One of those kind of like festival feel kind of things like mm-hmm. years ago. But there was so much going on. There was so much like content and, for lack of a better term, noise going on that it's like, yo, this is not what I want to do. Like, why am I here? And yeah. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily an embarrassing moment. It was kind of just like, nah, like this isn't for me. Right. But for me to know that wasn't for me and know my direction, I'd have had to. I had to go through that and know that this isn't what I'm looking for. This is what I'm trying to do. And also, the fact that I was able to bring so many people out just for that kind of event, was like, oh, I could have did this on my own. Yeah, got Like, it. if I can get this many tickets over this event, like, off my first art event, I can push a little harder and do it myself. That's how I really started producing my own shows. From that show, was just, I think they said, you got to sell 10 tickets, and whatever you don't sell, I think it was like $200 fee per artist, right? But if you sold 10 tickets, or you sold 20 tickets, I think, whatever the amount of tickets was at um it was 20 tickets at ten dollars each mm-hmm. then i was like all right cool then that's your fee you paid for your fee you don't oh, have gotcha. to pay yeah. i'm like all right cool and they said if you sold less than 20 you got to pay the difference if you sold like 15 that means you owe 50 bucks mm. i think i sold like 60 and i'm like yo if i can sell 60 tickets by my why am i giving you guys 600 bucks when i can essentially just take that money and Find my own space to work with yeah. or find my own gallery space to rent for like the evening and host my own show. Exactly. And have your own message. Yeah. Make it pop. And how like, you want to do, you do it. You made that whole experience is of and me and sense. not like, <laughs> not like, yo, you got art, you got fashion, you got music playing, you got like people oh, cooking my. shit. It was like, yo, <laughs> nah, never yeah. again. Never again. Oh, but it was dope. I actually met um, a really good customer of mine there, like somebody I'd never really known until that day. Dope dude um, out in Atlanta. How many pieces of my work do you have? He has to have like 
four or five pieces of my work now. Mm -hmm. Dope dude. Um, I met him there. So it worked out. Like, that worked out. I remember that night I cracked a piece of artwork. It was like a crazy night. Like, oh, yeah. and it was like that one night show you got to get in. Everyone's there and you got to go. You come right. with your work and leave with your work. And it was like, nah, man, this ain't for me. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily embarrassing. It was just like, was nah. Yeah. <laughs> like, too, too never again I'm doing this. Right. Nah, I feel you. You know what's crazy about that too, about situations like that? Is the fact like the, like the situation you in may be bad, but just like you said, it's like I yeah. met somebody good. Like yeah. you, you meet somebody like that's good that actually helps yeah. out in the long run. That particular that. experience, that's how I got into education. Because one of my, another client from that show, another mm -hmm. customer from that show, um, bought work and she was a teaching artist, so she got me into teaching the arts. As a dude who's collecting my work, um, excuse me, like I met tons of people there, but I just know I'll never do anything like that again. <laughs> right. Especially now, my work can't now. Like I know what works and what doesn't work. Okay. And sometimes knowing what doesn't work is just as positive as knowing, if not more, than knowing what does work. Okay. Cool. So. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Nah. Um, what I was gonna say, I how did you start like selling your products and? From the beginning, like, can you explain, like, the transition from, because I see, like, your pieces are actually big, and they're individual as far as, like, each thing is individual, like, you create it individually, but it's all one piece together, but how did you start from your house and then getting your own, your own and all kind of, like, art, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's all, like, one continuous story, which would be funny, right? Yeah. I remember the first piece I sold, and I didn't even know I was going to sell it. This was 2012, um, Hurricane Sandy was ripping through New York City. Okay. Um, so everyone was like stuck in their homes for like forever. Like mm -hmm. I was stuck home for two weeks because working on Wall Street, everything was closed. Okay. So I remember creating something, it was like a, a set of lips, but it was, the set of <laughs> lips was on glass. Okay. Like it was, to this day, I was at one of the cleanest like tape jobs I've ever done. And I remember someone like a good friend of mine saying, oh my God, I love this on Instagram. I just posted on Instagram, I'm like, hey, I'm doing this. I'm kind of sitting here. Not like, hey, I'm, this is for sale. It's kind of like, hey, I'm sitting here, I'm bored, and here you go. And someone's like, oh, how much? Then before I can reply on Instagram, she already sent me a text message like, yo, how much? I'm like, what do you mean, how much? Like, I'm not selling it. She's like, no, I want to buy it. And... She was just saying, oh, how much for this? I was kind of like, uh, I don't know. I just thought about materials, how much it cost me, and how much it would cost me to make more. I think I was like, all right, like 40 bucks. She's like, all right, cool. So I'm going to come pick you up from work tomorrow just to make sure that nothing happens in between that time you leave work, the time oh, you get home. Yes, you that mean. nothing, like, I want my work. I want nothing to stand in the way of that. That was before I, it was even cool to have. That's before, like, there's really Ron Draper art. It was just Ron making art, yeah. but it wasn't really Ron Draper art. So then... And this lady was totally random. Nah, as a friend of mine. Oh, okay, a friend of yours. Yeah. Right. So I was like, it was dope. She, he was asking me how much. I was like, oh, I don't know. But she's like, all right, I'm coming to um, just get this, and you're not going to stop this. Right. <laughs> and a few other people that have been there from the beginning that were like, I think at one point I was just saying, listen, I just want enough from you or enough whatever to be able to make more work. So if that means I need these supplies, you can give me these supplies, fine. Because at that point I would just want to create. I just want to start getting work out there. Mm. And that grew into wood was wood happened that happened by chance. Wood wasn't something that was my initial thing. Right. Hold on, what was your initial thing? Glass. Glass. Okay. Glass was my initial thing. Okay. Just because that's what I like I had glass in my I don't know why I had so much glass in my house. <laughs> but I had glass in my house. I think I had glass from this like mirror yeah. I had in my room that I kinda of took down. Yeah. And then a friend's mom had given me like these glass panels like a year before. Mm -hmm. So I had glass just kind of sitting around. And this is all expressive nature. Now, mind you, my father had just passed that June, 2012. So I was just in a place where I just needed, instead of harping on the negativity, I was just pushing the positivity. Gotcha. Like, that's always been me. Like, I'm not going to sit there and focus on negativity. I'm going to focus on what is positive and just talk myself into a better mood. So... Getting into the wood was different because this glass came in tiles. Okay. And with the tiles, it's easy to go to Home Depot. You buy them, they're small, you can wire them, easy. And then I remember, I was with my fiance, right? My, she was my girlfriend at the time, but yeah. we were leaving her like cousin's house or something in the Bronx. This is before Hurricane Sandy. So this is, Hurricane Sandy is October 29th, so this is like that 
Saturday, that Friday, or whatever it was. And I remember going and going, leaving the house, and there's like a frame in the garbage, like this big old, like ornate looking frame. I'm like, oh, that's dope. And thinking, I'd be a nice mirror because we were just rec- redecorating the house and whatnot. I'm like, I'd be a cool, like, mirror frame. So I got the frame. And I guess I was so arrogant to know that, yeah, I know the measurement. It was like two by three, like two by three feet. I didn't measure it, two by three, bang. Mm-hmm. Go to Home Depot, buy a two by three glass, like two by three piece of mirror, or piece of, like a mirror, a two by three foot um, sized mirror to put with the frame or display with the frame, whatever. I was gonna make it work. And I get home and I was like, oh, apparently this frame isn't two by three. Right. I was like, I don't know why I didn't measure it. It was just I just assumed that you know it was two by three. Yeah. <laughs> Way off. Damn. So I said, what the hell am I gonna do with this glass? I'm like, I might as well at this point. I was still making art here and there, mm-hmm. so people still buying pieces here and there, small pieces. I'm like, all right, so I might as well just use this, make some art, and turn this money I spent into money that can be earned. Right. Made this piece of artwork, but with all my other pieces, I had they were smaller, so I could put the wire behind it and it'd be okay. You couldn't put a wire behind that big piece of artwork. So I was like, what can I use to back it that you still be able to move it? Because I know you can glue it right to the wall, but what if I wanted to move it, I'd be stuck. Gotcha. So I thought, all right, I remember thinking these rings, right? There were these rings you can screw into. I was like, can I screw them into? I'm like, oh, you screw it into wood. Yeah. So I bought the wood. But Home Depot sells those pieces of wood individually. So I remember thinking, oh, cool, I can just buy them as I need them. And, you know, when I need them, I just use them. Right. So that kind of allowed me to start to make bigger pieces of artwork. Because I'd buy the wood from Home Depot, like the, small, like the smaller cuts, and then I'd be able to take the tiles and put them in whatever shape I want. Gotcha. Like they're foot squares. So if I want to make three by three, if I want to make two by four, if I want to make three by three, if I want to make like two by two, like I can make whatever size I wanted to, as long as it's kind of like a squared edge. Right. Make two by three, three by four, Whenever I can get the wood cut to that side and glue all the pieces together. Mm. So even at that point, I was making my glass work even came in pieces, but I just put it all together. Okay. And then what would happen is I'd go to Home Depot or I'd get enough orders that it wouldn't make sense for me to buy so many pieces of smaller wood. It just made sense for me to buy the bigger sheets mm. then have them cut them down. Gotcha. So, and then once they <laughs> cut them down, what happens is you end up having like extra pieces. Right. And those extra pieces, I started just working with, there would be pieces that weren't exactly like a foot rounded up. So it'd be like two and a half by three and a half. So I couldn't mm-hmm. use the glass on there even. So I just use them as just canvases themselves. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, why not put, cool. And it's kind of like, it's one of those things where you know, all right, whatever. Like, the wood is there. I might as well use it as opposed to letting it go. So I'm just going to play around, figure it out, and just right. turn that investment or turn that money spent into money earned. Oh, gotcha. That's why I got into like making work directly on the wood. Okay. And then I remember this is 2014, I want to say. This big, this dope show in Brooklyn um, at the Bishop Gallery. Shout out to Ian, Ian and the fam over there. I got to come through. I miss you guys. Um, but they had this big, biggie show, right? Okay. The only Christopher we acknowledge is Wallace. That was curated by DJ um, Clark Kent. Yeah. Dope, right? So I remember seeing that show and like I knew some of the gallery owners so they showed me the work and I'd be like yo this is dope work and it's like damn did you have I remember seeing this one I forget his name yo like they had this oil painting of Biggie and it looked like Napoleon I'm just like <laughs> yo like it was dope I'm like yeah. damn how the hell am I gonna compete with that yeah but then you look <laughs> at it and you think I saw all the work I'm like yo all this work is dope but all these things are like square I'm like, oh, let's work a square. Okay. Because the yeah. easiest way to stand out amongst a bunch of squares is to cut something into a different shape. Gotcha. So that's kind of where the shape cut wood started. Okay. okay. And my, then I kind of started being able to create and cut different things. And even like you mentioned, my work is big, but see how each one I can, yeah. like, it can break down. Exactly. Because i am always been a one-man army. Mm-hmm. So I can't move something like that, like something that's way bigger is easy so I can move a bunch of these. Right. Like, even if it means, yo, I'm leaving this gallery, I got to take all these big pieces of artwork. If no one's there to help me, even if it means I got to take nine trips back and forth to the car or back to the van or back to the truck, I still can get it done. Gotcha. So my work, even my bigger work has always been bigger, but always has the ability to be broken down mm-hmm. because I just always needed that for myself because I was a one-man show and it stacks up easier. Okay. Like, if you're working in your house, 
you can't have a piece of artwork that's huge, but if you have like five pieces that are like two by four, you can take them all down and just stacks to two by four. Yeah, gotcha. So you gotcha. can stack it and stash it somewhere so it's not in your way. Yeah. So it was just <clears throat> me knowing that I'm only one man, so I got to make it in pieces so I can move it way easier. So I'm, I'm always like, I'm a one man army. Right. So even now that I have like a whole team underneath me, it's still easier. Okay. <laughs> like it's always been my thing. And that, that kind of just, from what was a necessity, just grew into my style. Got you. And gives you the flexibility to do whatever you want too. Like I can, I've arranged this in like four different ways. Mm, like okay. certain pieces, I can arrange in multiple ways. I can turn, I can do whatever I want. It gives me pure flexibility. Yeah, nah. It's crazy, yo. Your room is even fire. I like how the way it's set up and all of that. Because every time, like I came here like three, four times, and each time it was always, always something, something different. different. Yeah. <clears throat> always. Like, I just like playing around with things. <laughs> right. And um, I want to talk about like the NAACP award you won. Like, what's the, can you talk about that? Like, yeah, the funny thing is the award is actually no one really sees that. It's like over there in the corner. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you just throw it over there. I'm over right. There. <laughs> it's over there. Like, I don't. You right. <laughs> I, played, I remember someone that came and saw it. Yeah, was that's Looking fine. at it, she was like, "Wait, when did you get this? Like, how? Like, how come no one know? Like, it, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah." Um, that that all about? kind of started with the initial work I was kind of doing in Harlem. And <laughs> one of those things where you, people see your work, but after seeing it so much and how it makes people feel and how it transforms like spaces, and people just realize the mission behind my artwork. Right. So I remember getting a, an email from Ms. Sylvia White, the chief of staff at Harlem Hospital, okay. and she was just telling me how the one of the heads of the NAACP just like saw me work so many places and didn't know. Then they had come for like a meeting of some sort. It was like, wait, who did this? Is this Ron J. I've been eyeing this guy's work for a while and like his work is amazing. I love what he's doing for the community. Mm-hmm. So I got the email from her and like, I think I sent it back. Like, did I read this right that they want to like give me an award for the artwork I've been creating? And like, yeah. And it kind of was just, wow. Like it's a really, really cool like experience. Yeah. So they had a whole reception, they had like food and like it was real, real, real like cool. And you had a, you had to do a speech? Yeah. Man, how how was that? How do you feel about that? Being that I know you do like to talk and you teach things like that. I have right? absolutely no problem. <laughs> oh, okay. Speeches okay. is not that like not doesn't bother me at all. Okay. Um like I don't know, I've always been to it. Not into it, but I've never had a problem like speaking in front of people. A lot of people. Like, I'm not going to say I'm not nervous. It doesn't happen. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. sometimes, you know, you're a little nervous. But I think everyone is. Like, even go look at who's, like, Jay-Z. He's performed a bunch of times, but I'm pretty sure he gets a sense of yeah. apprehension of just being a little nervous every time you go on. It's just the way it is. Take me honest. I'm guaranteeing you everyone does it. Like, right. it's like the jitters, but then once you kind of get into your flow, all that goes away. Goes away. Right. And, um, like, what do you dislike or like about the art world now? Um, the art world is, well, what I like is oh. the fact that the art world is growing. Okay. Like, the art world is at a point where people have, I still figure out, hold on, I'm trying to think, how does that, there's a lot, so I'm trying to figure out how yeah. can I put all of that into kind of like a sentence. People are inspired now. Okay. The art world is a lot because it's a good thing. I like it because right now people are creating things, people are creating work. It's like art is cool now. People yeah, are inspired it's by always it. always fresh. And which is partially also what I dislike. Got you. Because it's oversaturated? Yes. Okay. So what happens is you're having this big boom in the art world where people are loving the work and they're doing what they're doing. But what happens is you have people who are doing it for the wrong reasons. Got you. There are people doing it for the right reasons and people doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, art is still getting done. People's worldviews are still being shared. If their artwork for me, I guess, is responsible in the way I define responsible. And, um, yeah, so it's just like it's a lot of work, which is a good thing. It's a lot of work, which is also a bad thing. <laughs> got you. Got a bad you. thing because it's a lot of work that isn't responsible. People are doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care, but I want work. It's not like, oh, it's mad work, it's competition. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Like, I want, that's the bigger picture is the art changing the world. But it has to be art that's, um, it has to be art that works for what the world needs, not just 
art that is there because you want to make some money. Got you. Got you. So you just don't like the people who just doing it for the for the quick dollar, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, you're doing it for yeah. the quick dollar. You're taking, yeah. It's like for any industry. Right. Especially like if all the clothing lines. Clothing, yeah, if you're creating all these clothing lines, there are people who've grown up and really wanted this their entire lives, and now you're just creating, you're creating more traffic in the same lane because you want to do it to make some money. Gotcha. Then all of a sudden, it's like, all right, the money isn't there, so I'm going to leave. Yeah. So the people who are doing the work will always be there. Gotcha. But those who are kind of doing it just for the money or just for the notoriety, just for the, I guess... Fame, for lack of a better term, come and go. Got you. Nah, I, I feel what you're saying. Yeah, I hate that drink too. Um, I want to discuss like you know a few pieces. It could be real quick. You know what I'm yeah, saying? But like, um, I know like you into you know the Malcolm X. Like, is Jordan your favorite player? Like, nah. or, or you just alright, cool. And then, <laughs> and then um, one piece that I seen, but I see you took it down when I was walking when I was walking up here earlier. Is the Barkley piece. I take it down, it's right there. It's right there? Yeah. He probably came a different way. Yeah. Right I, outside I, the door. I bet. So I got to walk through and get it. Because I messed with that. The last time I was here, I seen that piece and I was like, damn. I've been in the same place. It's been right Word. there. You probably, you probably came in a different and way. And I walked around. I walked yeah, around. so you probably I didn't bet. see it when you walked in. I bet. Because when I came around, I was looking for it. And I'm like, yo, where that Barkley piece? I got to see that before I interview him. But I missed it. So speaking about that. You know, it's like the whole, like, I'm not your role model situation. What, like, how did that piece of come about being that? It's like, ah, right, you got your uplifting side and things like that. But then you got, like, the piece, like the Barkley piece. Yeah, it's the uplifting. Just if you understand the context yeah. of it, if you understand what they were doing with that campaign, because that's the I'm not a role model mm. campaign from Nike. Right. Where it's not like I'm not a role model, meaning I shouldn't be a role model. Yeah. What he's saying is... Just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should be raising your kids, which is pretty much saying, like, yo, raise your kids, people. Like, exactly. don't look for athletes who raise your kids. Be the parent that your child needs. That's kind of what it's not like. I'm not a role model. Don't yeah, follow definitely. me. His whole message is just like, uh, I shouldn't be raising your kids just because I can dunk a basketball. Right. Um, that, like, I love. It was just like, that's Charles Barkley. Yeah, like, Charles Barkley says a ton of, like, off the wall stuff. But <laughs> if you understand him, if you understand where he's coming from, yeah, you understand yeah. how smart that man is, and just like he just drops jewels, and he's very, very, very honest. And I respect exactly. that all the way. Exactly, and that's why no, no, and that's why I understood, it, and that's why I liked it so much, and that's why I wanted to ask you about that, cause I'm like, damn, yo, like you do the Jordan one, you do the, you did the Malcolm X joint, you got the Kanye joint, and I was like, when I seen that Barkley, I was like, yeah, this one stood out to me a lot, cause I'm like, damn, that's fire. I like how the way you did it. Um. Speaking about those, like, was those in events, like the Kanye and things like that? that yeah, was the Kanye one was done for the Life of Pablo exhibit that was in May. I can't remember the exact date. I know it was in May. Um, cool event. Um, it was all kind of Kanye-themed art. Yeah. Because his album had just been released. And I don't know, like, I've always dug Kanye just because he's just, he's creative. Like, okay. I love creative spirits. And he's just kind of like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I do. Mm-hmm. And you guys will recognize how good I am or how good I was way after I'm gone. Right. Like, you'll appreciate me later. Gotcha. Type of thing. Gotcha. I like that. Hell yeah. Um, and can you describe, like, a time, the first time when you realized, like, yo, this is something I had to absolutely do, being that you was in college for something else and you realized, and you always been in art, but you realized, like, nah, this is something I need to do and I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It was when I was the crossroad between, like, working my 9 to 5 and creating artwork and knowing, like, at one point you work in a 9 to 5 thinking this is what I want, like, you know, this is life, I'm going to work my X amount of years, you know, do what I got to do, grow up, go up the corporate ladder. And you think that's the way life is supposed to be. And you don't know, you have no other point of reference, so you don't know if that's not what you want your life to be. So when I started getting back to artwork and I realized there's like a fire in me that I've never, I haven't seen in years, it's kind of like, you know, this is what I need to be doing. Like, this is something that I don't mind getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning for. I don't mind going to sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning for. Like, this is what I need to be doing. I just need to figure out how to make money from it and make a living from it. Right. Because I don't, I don't make art for the money, if that makes sense. No, no, but I understand. I like, I'm not doing this for the money. money. Like, my job is not, I'm not nah. doing this just for the sake of money. Nah, you still got to eat, yeah. though. But I get what exactly. you're saying. Yeah, like, you still got to eat, but... My I, artwork yeah. ain't free, but I'm not yeah. doing this for the money. <laughs> right, there you go. Like, it's not like I'm doing this for the love, yeah. but I'm just turning my love into something that 
I get to live by. Exactly, and that's the best way to have it. Like when you're doing something you love, it's Absolutely. not even a job no more. Not and at that's all. the whole point of your That's why I can be here yeah. all day. Right. That's all fire. Day. Yeah, I like that. And then um what creative patterns or like routines you do? Like is this something like that you gotta like do before you start working, like something you eat, or it's like, yo, I gotta have this, I gotta drink this, or I gotta prepare myself like this. You know how some people have those like weird routines or something like that, or their own unique way of working. Like, it's something you gotta have specifically for yourself. Uh, really, usually music. Okay. Like, and depending what kind of art I'm creating, depending on what kind of work I have to get done, not just necessarily the type of art, but just. Do I gotta cut through like three sheets of plywood today? Like, do I need? Is it like? Is it a labor-intensive day? Is it a thought-intensive day? That'll kind of determine how I curate the music for the day. Gotcha. So music will keep me going. Like, if I need to get through something, I'm gonna get through it. Mm-hmm. Like, if I need to work through something, music will kind of keep me amped enough that I kind of need to get it through. But music, other than that, like you know, my snacks, my water, you know. All right. Man, nah, I'm, I'm, a very, like, I'm a very simple guy. I don't need anything. I don't need my. I don't need candles to be burned. Yeah. I don't need. Yeah. Like I don't need like to yeah. tap my feet twice and okay. rub my head. Like no, it's just. Yeah. I just need music and something to munch on. Right. Some water. I got you. And then um, a creative medium that you want to pursue but haven't yet. Steel. Oh. Okay. Easy. Got you. <laughs> like that's the kind of. Playing around with a few things, working with metals, not sculpting, working with like metals. Okay. And you're seeing how that works and how, like, what the dynamic of that would be. Okay. Like, how can I cut metal? Okay. So I know it can be done. Yeah. Just. And it's in the same way, like the same type of art mm-hmm. form you got, but just using the steel, using the yeah, metal. Yeah, and you're seeing how different, how much different I can play around with certain mm-hmm. things. That'll look crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, advice, like the best advice that was like, that, that was given to you? When doing this or when going through your little phase, like, yo, forget this nine to five, I can't do this shit. And, like, or whatever phase it was, like, the best advice that you always take, even now, through your success, you still have that in mind, that little humbleness that, you know what I'm saying, use that. Two things come to mind. Um, Biggie from Sky's the Limit said, don't make moves unless your heart's in it. Okay. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. If your heart is not in it, if you don't love your choice, don't do it. Life's too short to do things you don't want to yeah. do. And just my mother kind of just keep making sure whatever you do, just keep loving it. It was kind of the same thing, but just do it because you love it. And if you don't love it, then don't do it. She just quick. My mother was like, all right, you want to quit your job? As long as you can pay me the money you still owe me. She was like, <laughs> whatever you do, as long as you're happy. Like, yeah. life's too short not to be happy. or yeah, And to be indirect. Okay. Indirect. Or just take the risk. Like, yeah, people are so stuck on certain things, but... He's so scared. I so see scared. It. But it's not that you're scared. It's just, how can I explain? You always ask me, how come you have so much courage to leave your nine to five, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that I had courage. Well, it could be courage. Because I think people, you have more courage if you're able to go to a job that you hate every day. Yeah. That takes a lot of courage. <laughs> Got you. I don't have that much. <laughs> Got if you, you go to a job that you hate every day, I applaud you because that takes a hell of a lot of courage yeah. to get up and... Fake that shit the whole and time. And fake that yeah. all day and deal with that tension, deal with that stress. That takes a lot oh, that dude. I personally don't have in me. Gotcha. So it's easy for me. Like, yo, I'm out. Like, I can't do this. Yeah. And I see something that I love and I know how to work until I get what I want. Okay. Like, I work. Like, right. I work more than I did when I first started. Like, people, I think, don't realize how much, like, I work. Gotcha. And, nah, that's good to know. And, um, what'd you call that? Damn. Yeah, um, I know that you you do you still you do the teaching in uh Brooklyn, right? Absolutely. And how does that? How do you like that? How does that work? How did that come about? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you like that? And like, what type of experience is that? And just motivation for you to keep on going with your art, knowing that you got young kids actually like looking up to you. The job of an artist is to tell the story, right? So, if it's twofold, you can tell the story and the story, know that there's a bigger, st- you have to understand artists who tell the story, and you also have to understand that the story is much bigger than you. Mm-hmm. And know that there are plenty of stories out there. And if you can help influence, if you can't tell the whole story, you help influence those who can, or help influence enough people who can. 
And I just had like a sore spot for young men of color. It was just like, yo, a lot of kids don't tell their stories. There's so many things that are going on that they lash out in ways that deem them violent, deem them uncontrollable. But sometimes you just need to listen to what they have to say. So they might not all be the greatest speakers, but everyone speaks to their artwork, whether you know it or not. Like whether they understand that they're speaking to their artwork or not, they do. Like I learned so much about my students through their artwork. And the thing is, if I want the change in the world to be what I want it to be, it's not going to happen with me. It's not going to happen in our generation at all. Mm-hmm. It's going to be beyond that. Right. So you have to make sure that you're giving the right lane, the proper path for those who are coming after you in a sense that I won't be it my whole life, but you guys are going to be the leadership that my children look up to. Like, I don't have a child yet, but if, I, if when I do, you guys will be, like, when I'm old and done, you guys will be the leadership in this country. You guys will be the leadership in the community. Right. So I need to make sure that you guys are still preparing and fighting the same fight that I was fighting in the sense of just this worldview and understanding that, yo, know, people of color have been mistreated, and that's okay. But our job is to make it better for the next generation. It just so happens that I got to invest in you because you guys are responsible for the generation after, which will be my family got you. growing up. Definitely. And it's like, yo, it was dope. And I remember going to high school and hating artwork after that. So I wanted to make sure that <laughs> yeah. I want to ignite artwork. Instead of taking artists and taking that love away, I want to take students who never even thought about artwork as a career, thought about artwork as something they can possibly love, right. and just show them how powerful it can be. Yeah, and then with the way you presenting it, you showing them from jump, like, yo, it ain't about the bread. It ain't about the money. It's yeah. not about how much skill you have. Because I can find artists that are way more skilled than me in terms of like painting and details and but that's not what art is about art is about the expression the skill is secondary got you you just want to get your stuff out so this is how you express your viewpoint this is how you make yourself feel but it's how you make people on around the world understand who you are Mm -hmm. it's how you get people to understand what your message is because long this will last longer than i will yeah oh dear so i don't want my message to die with me so if that means living through my artwork living through my students and just understand that that's what I'm teaching them, and they're going to be able to teach other people. And those people will be able to teach other people. So, like, the effects of my reach or the distance of my reach will be a lot further than just my artwork. Now I got people under the toe, under toe who kind of understand what I'm doing, and they're still pushing along the same way that I pushed along. Got you. Got you. And then, um, like, what is your own um, dream project? Do you have a dream project? I don't think I have a dream project. To be I don't ever even give it a thought gave that a thought really it's not like hey I, i've always wanted to do this and nah, i was just i just want to change the world got you now nah, like, i'm on my dream mission already okay bro. it's not as if it's one particular thing it's like nah we're gonna do this all right that's it and then like what's your like professionally like when it's all said and done like what is it that you want to have like your main goal as far as that like okay you know, you actually into your dream project now that you say it's not something specific, but the end all, like, is it something? There's like, nothing concrete. Like, when I'm, when everything is said and done and I, and I retire, I hang up my, hang up my toolkit, hang up my drill, hang up my drill, hang up my jersey. Yeah. Um, I just want people to know that Ronald Draper was a guy who was crazy enough to think he can change the world through his artwork and did. Gotcha. So it's not a, an, it's not a physical thing or a concrete thing that is going to determine the level of my success is how much I inspired people, how much I made it okay to be a good person, how much I taught people to love. It wasn't just like, Mm. all right, here's this, I worked with that person. That doesn't matter to me at all. That. Not, not even close. Got you. And then before we go, any advice you want to give for like upcoming artists that's out there that's, that's trying to do something or like, well, who's made in any art field that's trying to get into it or trying to get the whole concept right? Um, well, do what you do and understand that you have to keep your head out the clouds. There are going to be people who are telling you to look at this and look at that and kind of participate in this but it's all about the work the hard work is done in the dirt the dirt is where the flowers grow so keep your damn head out the clouds don't worry about who's watching don't worry about who's paying attention don't worry about who's viewing your work on instagram just keep your head down work hard and just get the job done got you 
All right, so there you have it, y'all. That was episode 11 of the Pooty Tim Show. I was here with my man, Ron Draper. Yeah. And you know, I'll catch y'all later. Now I mean? Good speaking to you, brother. Of course. Pleasure's all mine. All right, have a good one. Same to you.